Okay, EP Human Geo. Agriculture from the second revolution to the third revolution. This actual video is only going to talk about the second revolution, and the green revolution is in a separate, uh, is going to be in a separate YouTube lecture. Again, you guys need to take notes, have somebody pause and stop this so you're able to get everything down, and then make sure that you write down the extra information that I'm giving you also. Here we go. All right, so, oh man. Second Agricultural Revolution, a series of innovations, improvements, and techniques used to improve the output of agricultural surpluses started before the Industrial Revolution. So we had the first agricultural revolution where we stopped being a nomadic people and we started to actually grow. We were no longer hunters and gatherers. Second agricultural revolution is when we see the improvement upon how we actually grew that or had, how we actually cultivated would be a better, an AP word, um, how we actually cultivated that food. Uh, we started the improvements over the, before the industrial revolution because the agricultural revolution actually allowed for the industrial revolution to, to occur. That's a very important thing to understand. I'm going to say it again. The agricultural revolution allowed the industrial revolution to start because we move past subsistence. All right, new crops, um, potatoes and corn from the new world, new land was cultivated with better soil prep and fertilizers. So what happened specifically is we brought potatoes over to um, parts of Europe. And what happened is land that was previously considered marginal and land that we couldn't grow on all of a sudden could be cultivated. So more land is being cultivated, number one, so there's more food, less people need to be farmers. Starts with innovations in Great Britain, Netherlands, Denmark, and other areas of Western Europe. Um, we see new inventions like the seed drill, which allowed, this actually increased efficiency because what happened is farmers were able to plant all of their, the seeds, less seeds were wasted with the seed drill because it implanted them straight into the ground and also they were planted in a straight row. So it was easier for farmers to distinguish the weeds from the actual plants that were being grown because if they weren't in the line, they were clearly a weed. Um, crop rotation would be the idea of, it's kind of a step past um, the slash and burn and um, the other practices that were used earlier. Crop rotation allowed um, if certain plants were, were actually let's say that they depleted the nitrogen in the soil or certain elements that were were present in the soil, what would happen is then they would rotate it with a crop that would replenish it or would not need those certain um, elements within the soil, if that makes sense. So crop rotation allowed, was just took better care of the soil in general. Um, I think that's it for what I want to add onto this slide. So we're going to move on. All right. The European government in the Second Agricultural Revolution had a huge role as well. The Enclosure Act encouraged consolidation of fields into single owner holdings. So what would happen is we would see multiple less fields used inefficiently. What happened with the Enclosure Act is that all of these became large plots of land and increased the size of farms. So we would have, instead of 30 farmers on, on this one small plot, of land, we would see it all enclosed into one large farm so it could be farmed much more efficiently. The impact was that fewer people were needed on these farms because of this, which led to the Industrial Revolution. Sustain these advances with new farm equipment like tractors and combines, railroads to open up the new land. So because less people were needed, guys, this is an important thing to get, because less people were needed because of the Second Agricultural Revolution, they left the farms and went to the cities where they then participated in the Industrial Revolution. Make sure you write that down, that is important. Um, the Industrial Revolution then further fueled, so these are a symbiotic relationship, they further fueled the Agricultural Revolution. Railroads helped to move agriculture into new areas and regions because farmers could be further away from the cities and still get their agricultural goods into the cities in time for um, in time before they spoiled. All right, the 18th century's European colonies became sources of raw agricultural and mineral products for the industrializing nations. 
So we saw a lot of times during colonialization, they would these would be what we would consider cash crops, right? They would be things that they specifically wanted to grow, and then they would be imported into the colonizing country. Now many of these countries, which were once colonies of Europe, especially those in Central America, are still heavily involved in the same types of agricultural production as they were hundreds of years ago. We're going to talk about this later in the chapter, about how this actually isn't always a good thing. So Cameroon was, was heavy for tea. We see coffee production in a lot of Central America. We see Haiti is an ex excellent example of sugar production and that the majority of the production is for export. It's not, and bananas is another good example, it's not for the home country's consumption. It's all for export. Okay, so second agricultural revolution kind of brings in this idea of spatial layout of agriculture. Johann Heinrich von Thunen is the first guy who came up with this. You need, we often will talk to him, talk about him as von Thunen. You need to know that name. He studied agricultural phenomena and he said that as he traveled further outside of the city, usually one crop would give way to another in succession. Now there was no difference in the land. It was purely the distance from the central city. When he mapped it, he found that each town or market center was surrounded by a set of concentric rings with which certain crops dominated. This guy's model is very important. Now it's going to be like the concentric zone model that we learned about in urbanization, except it has to do with um, it has to do with agriculture. So von Thunen's model, this is it. It's, consent, it's just a series of rings. It looks a lot like the urbanization model, but this one has to do with agriculture. So he said, nearest the town, farmers produced commodities that were perishable and commanded high prices. Now think about things that would be perishable and commanding high prices. The best example that I can give you would be things like dairying, so anything to do with dairy products, or Perishable fruits, strawberries, are a good example. So that would be produced nearest the central city. Then, at this time, when von Thunen was coming up with this model, we still had forests that were basically used for chopping down wood around a city. So that would be the second zone, would be considered the, the forest. Further out from town, we see intensive, extensive field crops. So those would be things like wheat and grain. All right, that would be in our third range. So things that are field crops that could be transported into the city that are a little bit bulkier but less perishable. And in the fourth outer ring, things that required lots of space. So things like ranching and raising of livestock. Things that w this there wasn't enough space to be had and could be transported by train quickly into the city. Um, von Thunen's model has modern applications. We still see it in many... Caribbean islands, Denver and New York City, also can you can overlay von Thunen's model and it would be functional. All right, the beginning of the Green Revolution, and then the, and then we're going to do two more slides, I think, and then the, the next lecture will pick up with that. This is also known as the Third Agricultural Revolution and dates back into the 1930s. Norman Borlaug, that's a great name, um, father of the, what we consider the Green Revolution. Borlaug received his Ph.D. in plant pathology and genetics from Minnesota in 1942. He took up agricultural research position in Mexico, developing semi-dwarf, high-yield, disease-resistant wheat varieties. In the mid-20th century, he led the, the intro of these varieties combined with agricultural production techniques into Pakistan, Mexico, and India. He won the Nobel Prize in 1970 in recognition for his contributions to world peace by increasing the food supply. So this was a time in the world where, guys, there was a lot of, there was a lot of fear that we weren't going to be able to feed our ever-exploding population, our increasing population size. So this is kind of like the idea of the Malthusians, if that rings a bell, I hope it does. Remember how the Malthusians thought we, were gonna, we, were, we weren't going to be able to sustain our population? This was so Norman Borlaug was kind of a guy who was working uh, during this time of the Malthusian thought that we weren't going to be able to feed the world, and then he comes up with these new types of crops, and that's why he won the Nobel Prize, which is pretty impressive. He's just a guy to know. Um, he's just a just a, a good name to know because um, if he ever comes up on the test, and he's not in your book, so make sure we get his info down. 
All right, so reasons for the green revolution. Starts with agricultural scientists in the American Midwest experimenting with technologically manipulated seed varieties to increase crop yields. Now, I talked about crop yields in my other lecture, but crop yields is literally the how productive a unit of land can be. So we wanted the land to be more productive. Many areas wish to improve crop yields as there is worry over global hunger. In MDCs, more developed countries, farming is no longer a primary activity. So a way to grow more with less workers. So we see intensive mechanization. Guys, this is the idea of our of the crop sprayers, of combines, of these large tractors, these gigantic machines that help push our productivity is so high. That's why it's not a primary activity so much. Many look to the transfer of agricultural products to new areas. We're trying to bring in, kind of like we did with the second agricultural revolution, to bring in further crops into these marginal lands. Where can we grow more food and how can we grow, how can we have successful yields on poorer soil? Because we're trying to bring more land into, into production. So here's a great example of how we did that. All right, so successes of the Green Revolution. In the 1940s, we attempted to find a hybrid maize or corn seed in Mexico, which led to, 20 years later, Mexico no longer needed to import um, corn because of the this, we combined this new corn, um, or genetically modified this new corn plant so that it would grow better in in um, the Mexican climate and they no longer needed to import it. They completely produced their own because of this. Uh, they were completely self-sufficient because of this new hybrid corn seed. We then turned to the production of IR8, a new rice product that crossed the Chinese and Indonesian variety in the 1960s, which produced a higher yield than either of the previous rice plants. It was, it was, it was great. It actually produced a large, they call them a larger head on the, um, on the actual rice plant, but that wasn't good enough. So the next step was IR36, which was bred in, in the 1980s and developed to produce three crops a year, and by 1992 was the most widely grown crop on earth. So IR8 brought great higher yield. IR36 could be grown three times a year, so like 110 days I think is how long is the growing cycle for that, and it was re highly resistant to pests. So not only did it have a higher yield, but it was also less likely to be, we were less likely to have any kind of loss to pests. The Green Revolution has also brought high yield varieties of wheat and corn from the U.S. to other parts of the world. Today, most famines in the world are from political instability, not a failure in production of goods. So we are experiencing famine because food isn't getting to people, not because we aren't having enough if that makes sense. India became self-sufficient for itself in the 1980s, which is a huge deal because India is one of the most populous countries. Asia saw a two-thirds increase in rice production between 1970 and 1995 because of IR8 and IR36. And production increases not only from new seed varieties, but also from the use of fertilizers, pesticides, irrigation in some places, and significant capital improvements. Capital improvements would be things like increasing the use of the mechanization of the tractors, the mechanization of the combines and everything else. Fertilizers, pesticides, I think that's pretty self-explanatory, but there's a science behind this, guys. This is not a primary economic activity. This is something that's much more, um, much more involved. However, there are issues with the Green Revolution. There's limited impact in certain geographic regions. Traditional focus on rice and wheat and corn have created a limited impact in Africa, where agriculture is based on different crops and low soil fertility make agriculture a less attractive area for foreign investment. Now, this is a big problem because think about there's a lot of where are the companies that are creating these gen genetically modified organisms or genetically modified crops? They're in the United States. And is there a lot of money in Africa where, for for genetically modified organisms. No. So sadly, that is why we don't see a lot of GMOs being being created that could go over to Africa because there's not a lot of money to be made in that area. Gene manipulation also can create some health risks. They, they have been linked to potential hormone imbalances and not enough is known data-wise about GMOs. We're going to talk about that a little bit more, but sometimes when we, sometimes they'll cross-pollinate different, um, 
they'll take the, maybe they need something that needs to be pest resistant. So they take a, um, and let's say that avocados are pest resistant, and they put a gene from an avocado into a carrot. However, you're allergic to, to avocados, but you're not allergic to carrots. But when you eat that carrot, you then have an allergic reaction because it has the genes from the avocado, if that makes sense. So they're saying that there's a lot out there about GMOs that we don't know. So that could be a potential risk. So there are drawbacks to this and different effects that it has on the human body because these are relatively new, right? In the last 50 years, have we really started this gene manipulation within plants? And that will be where we conclude for today.